we'll try to do a uh, top hat for attendance next time. Um, so uh, make sure you see me uh, before you leave or me or Matt or somebody in the course uh, to make sure we grab attendance. Uh, I apologize yet again, but attendance is uh, something that BU gets very angry at me if I don't do properly. So that's why I try to be careful about it. I'm also not very good at remembering it. But I think uh, we should be able to use Top Hat for it going forward. And so you'll just be able to like say, I'm here. Um, and it should be pretty easy. Uh, so if you haven't already, um, you can just get the Top Hat basic account and we'll send you like, a, a, you should have already gotten an invite. Did you already get an invite? Okay, cool. So just make sure that's like set up or whatever. Um, I thought I could do the Top Hat thing kind of like without outside Top Hat. But I was mistaken. I just used it in the last class. Worked pretty well, um, but I didn't do the setup for it correctly. So uh, we'll do it next time. So just make sure you grab attendance for today. Um, and today uh, we will have. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, teams and teamwork and team agreements first, and then we're going to talk about ethics with a guest lecturer. Uh, there will be a, an assignment for that. Um, watch for a Piazza note. It should be released in grade scope right this second. Uh, so if you don't see the Piazza note or I don't get it out fast enough and you want to go take a look at it, uh, it is in grade scope already. It's pretty straightforward, um, but I will caution you it's due 4 p.m. on Monday. Okay. And the reason is because it's, it's, got, it's got a pretty manual grading component and we want to use it by Thursday. So we got to have enough time to like look at your submissions. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. All right, so let's talk about teamwork and teams. So uh, first of all, uh, one of the things that's really interesting and like, you know, there are some positives to COVID, um, but sociologists, you know, particularly ones who look at um, kind of corporate culture, which is actually sometimes considered a different field, but it's similar, um, are, you know, I, I don't want to say they're excited about COVID, but they they appreciate the fact that it has now made many, many teams instantly remote. And so as a result, it's changed the dynamic of those teams and it shows something interesting, right? Or shows some interesting things that they can study about like what makes a good team. Um, actually, before I move on, for anybody who is late and you're normally here early, let's try to keep these two columns free until start of class because we have a whole bunch of students who are coming from like other classes and rather than making them walk across the room or to the corner or whatever in the middle of the lecture they can sit in one of those seats uh which i think all of you just did but you know uh so future reference if you're here early try to sit on this side of the room uh and if you are here late hopefully those will be open so you don't have to walk in front of me um because i know that's embarrassing uh and so i don't want to make you do it okay so moving on so uh, I am a huge fan of, I actually think corporate organizational stuff is really interesting and I always have. I've never worked in the field or anything like that, um, but I've always found it kind of interesting. So I've kind of kept up with it. So I strongly recommend if you don't already, uh, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, check out HBR or Harvard Business Review. There's usually a lot of really interesting stuff about it. And a lot of uh, the content I'm about to show it's kind of cribbed from some of their thinking. Uh, and so, and then my own kind of personal experience. And so that's why I wanted to give you a little bit of context, but check it out if you, you know, find that kind of thing interesting. Um, so what makes a good team? So studies have shown that there's three things that really are important to teams. And we're gonna use these terms because they, they work well, even though the individual words are kind of confusing. So, First, I'm going to say autonomy. Okay. So, as all of you are in tech, or, you know, I assume you're mostly in tech, uh, you've probably seen the word autonomous uh, quite a lot. What do you think autonomy means? And kind of related, what would it mean for a, an individual on a team? Anybody tell me what autonomy means? Come on, somebody's got to know. Yeah. Right, so autonomy means independence, right? Uh, in my other class, uh, somebody said freedom, right? Which is kind of a little bit broader than what I mean, but uh, autonomy is a good term for, you know, it's like you, you have your own agency, right? Um, and so we talk about it in tech a lot when we talk about like autonomous robots, right? We talk about AI, that's autonomy. 
Um, but when we talk about teams, what we mean is that the individuals on the team have autonomy uh, to do various things. And we'll talk about them more in detail as we go. All right, what about competence? What does competence mean? No snide jokes. Anyone? Come on, what is competence? Yeah. Uh, being able to complete tasks. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Being able to complete tasks. Did you have another definition? Okay. Uh, so competence is basically your ability to do what's asked of you, in a sense, right? Um, so, and it can be in a lot of different ways. But so again, uh, this is by about the individuals on a team. They all need to be competent. And we're going to talk about that more too. Um, and then what about relatedness? Let me have a, so this is a word, I don't know if I've ever seen this word before, um, except in this context. So feel free to not know exactly what it means, but anybody have a guess based on the, what it sounds like? How well does the team work together? Yeah, so how well does the team work together, except because we're trying to define how well a team works together, it's really like how connected the humans are within the team. Okay, so how related are they to each other? It does not mean we endorse all teams should be married to each other. It's just that they're related in, in some way. So we'll talk about that more a bit. Um, and then kind of two things uh, that usually lead to good teams are things like team agreements and job descriptions. Okay, we'll talk about those more in a bit too. Um, and I believe when you join the team, uh, when you join your teams to do the projects, uh, there, I think, is going to be a team agreement issued uh, by uh, kind of the general Spark team from your PM kind of talking about various things. But if we get to it, we will talk about it more today. Um, all right, so talking about autonomy. Um, so autonomy is like two halves, okay? First half is being able to define your own work. So if you remember when we talked about project uh, methodologies, we were talking about Scrum and Kanban, we were talking about those cards, right? So those cards should be written by the team members, okay? They should not be supplied to you by a customer or some executive on high or something like that. They can provide you oodles of information, okay? But the team itself should be the ones who are writing those cards or writing what you're doing. Okay. And if an even better is if the human who is going to do that piece of work, it's even better if they write it for themselves. Okay. So that's kind of what we mean by autonomy is that at least the team has autonomy in that they're writing their own actions. Um, but then even better, the individual humans have autonomy. So even if the team writes the card, when somebody picks it up, they should have full flexibility to rewrite the card as they see fit. They may want to share it amongst the team to make sure it still says what they think it says. But other than that, you know, it's, it's helpful for them to define it themselves. Then the other half of that is also the ability to execute their work. Okay. So they may have heard of micromanagement. All right. What is micromanagement? Ideas. Come on. Somebody's got to have a definition of micromanagement. It's exactly what it sounds like. Managing at a very small scale, right? So when uh, typically you see this in reference to managers, so someone who is in charge of the team uh, has very strong opinions on every little bit of work, okay? Um, and that is not autonomy, right? The other thing that often happens in a team is you have one person who thinks they know more than everyone else on the team. And so they're the ones micromanaging you, even though they're a peer, right? Now, that is, to be, to be clear about this, they, they're, that's different from kind of chunk of work size. As you're, you know, all of you are relatively junior in the software engineering space. So the chunk of work you may be given, which hopefully, assuming I'm competent, uh, would be a lot smaller than the chunk of work I might be given, right? So when you're working with a junior person, you tend to give them smaller chunks, but you still have to give them autonomy to work within that chunk. And then as you get more experience and seniority and all that stuff, the chunks kind of get bigger. So, and I clarify that just because that's not the same as micromanagement. All right, and the other part of it is, um, part of what makes a good team is also good team leadership. 
And so I had a, one of the best compliments I've ever had uh, as a manager many, many years ago um, was that I operate like a clear umbrella, okay? So when the, you know, S word is raining down, I protect my team, right? But at the same time, the umbrella is clear. So executive management or whoever can still see all the members and what they contribute, right? So I take all the junk and deal with it but the team members still get credit for all the work they do. I don't, you know, I don't take the credit. So part of that autonomy, right, is the ability to actually show what you did in a way that other people, other people are consuming, like particularly executives or whatever. But that's kind of what I mean by that bullet point. So autonomy is very, very important. And I think very succinct and relatively easy to define and often very difficult to experience. All right, questions? All right, I know it's late in the day, but we need more coffee. Um, okay, so competency. Um, so we define competency as your own kind of ability to do stuff, okay? Which is part of it, but it's also the expectation that other people on your team can also do stuff, okay? So kind of going back to that micromanagement thing, it's like, I expect my teammates to be able to deliver on what they say they are gonna deliver. Right? And that's really important because it engenders trust within the team when I am confident that everybody on my team can do whatever it is that they need to do. And I don't have to worry about it. So that's a very important thing. And kind of related to that is it's important to remove bad apples from a team. Sometimes that bad apple can just be somebody who just doesn't mesh with that particular team. But other times it can be because they're just not good, okay? And primarily when I say not good, I mean, they are the micromanagement style or they, you know, they're just, you know, off on their own never, never land. Uh, and they're just a total cowboy. It's rare that I think that the person is just not able to perform the work. Although that does happen. I think that's a lot easier problem to solve. It's more the person who brings bad blood to the team that I'm more worried about in that bad apple scenario. And so, you know, a little bit not safe for work. I'm sure you've all heard plenty of swear words in your life, um, but there's this guy who uh, I used to know from kind of the conference circuit, who uh, was one of the leaders in the Gen2 open source uh, distribution of Linux, um, who uh, identified that the community wasn't doing very well. And the community wasn't doing very well. And what does that mean for a Linux distribution? Well, that means that like, it's not producing the software, right? So he identified that this person who is, was, you know, let's just say like on a scale of one to 10 in productivity was a 10 producing a lot of stuff, but was causing a lot of other people to either not join the community or leave the community because of personality style, largely. Um, and doing things like the micromanagement things that I kind of described. And so, as you might imagine, it's difficult to take, particularly when you talk about it, like a distribution, which is largely volunteers. It's difficult to say, I got a, I got a 10 value person, but if they're scaring away a whole bunch of fours, it's probably worth it to remove them, right? Even though the people that you might be replacing them with may not be as productive individually. But if there's enough of them, it makes a difference. And so he actually did some like data science on this and uh, did some before and after uh, to look at how the community was doing both, uh, you know, kind of like leading into this guy being asked to leave the project and what happened afterwards. Uh, and it, it really does show. And I would say this, the, the math, the science of it is a little, little squishy, but it's really interesting example of like, you know, bad apple causing problems and then you remove the bad apple and now you can be productive again. Uh, and so I do, and I think this is a very hard thing to deal with. Um, you know, I have fired people. It is not pleasant at all, right? It is like for the person doing it, it is not comfy. It doesn't matter how bad they are, um, but sometimes it's important, okay? So when you have a teammate who is not part of the team, that can be a really bad thing. All right, and so this one is often the hardest thing, okay? And it's not only hard in to define, but it's also hard to kind of engender, 
Okay. So has anybody ever, uh, how many people here have ever had an internship of any kind? Okay. Or, or a job, actually. Um, okay. So in that organization, did they ever talk about uh, improving the culture or making sure the culture stuck or, you know, things like that? But the words were wrapped around culture um, and making sure that the, there was an organizational or company culture. All right, what did that mean, you think? It wasn't entirely just buzzwordy, you know, HR, blabber. Um, so what is it? Right, so, so I think if, if all of you have been in a workplace where they kind of mentioned culture, that kind of thing, that's the closest thing to what I'm talking about here. Except when we talk about this relatedness thing in terms of a team, we really mean within the team, okay? And so one of the things that I think gets missed a lot in those culture discussions is that if you have enough teams that are all connected to each other quite tightly, you actually end up with a culture at the organizational level, right? Because people cross teams, because people know each other, you know, whatever. So you end up actually with a pervasive culture. And personally, I think those culture discussions are a lot of the time they're these top down things. When in fact, if you kind of focus on the teams from a bottom up perspective, they can be actually more effective. This is a little bit my personal opinion and not really backed by science, except anecdotal. So, um, and so, but there's a couple of things about how do we connect the people of the team together in a non-work way is important. And so here's a couple of things about it, right? Um, so, and these probably should be in a different order. So the first one I'm gonna mention here is chit chat is not a bad thing, okay? So, having a structure by which the team can get to know each other or they can connect on various things. Like, so my example for this over COVID uh, in particular was that we would have like a weekly meeting and it started out with the label of happy hour, which uh, has been happening all across the industry and lots of other industries over this whole COVID period of these remote happy hours, okay? Most people have said they haven't worked very well. Um, ours happened to work pretty well. And I think the reason was is because the, it was scheduled usually for an hour. And the first 15 or 20 or sometimes even 30 minutes was actually like a team meeting. Like there was something about, you know, what the team was doing. Hey, it's review period, you know, or whatever, something about the team. Um, and then it would just kind of devolve into chit chat. Right? And we had a couple of like serious whiskey aficionados. We had one guy who raced cars as well, built them. So we'd hear about his latest races and he was building this massive garage to work on these cars. And we, so we'd hear these updates. And, and so it really it made us more aware of the things that we do outside of work, which connected us together better. Um, so that's just kind of one example of a thing we did uh, to accomplish this. Another example was, um, Many years ago, a friend of mine used to work for, I think it was Oracle. He was on a team of about five or six people and every single one of them was, a, was remote, like worldwide remote. But so what the company did was they actually got that team together once a quarter to just be in the same place at the same time so they could get to know each other, so they could have dinner together, so they could you know, talk and figure out what their plans were, things like that. And it made a huge difference to that team. Um, that group of people, kind of stayed connected for years later, even though they left the company and things like that. And so, I mean, it really does make a difference. Um, so another thing that is important, and um, Matt and I were talking about this the other night, um, is that, you know, most of you in here probably default to something like text messaging to communicate with people. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, so the problem with that is that text of any kind is a relatively low bandwidth communication mechanism, okay? Why, like one of the reasons that, um, you know, doing texting back and forth, whatever, you can start to feel sometimes when a conversation is kind of going off the rails, right? And it's important to try to remember in the back of your mind that when it's going off the rails like that, go to a high bandwidth mechanism of communication. And in fact, if you kind of push towards that more often, so if it's only slightly off the rails rather than really off the rails, go to it earlier, you know, so like favor it, that will also help that relatedness within the team. Um, 
video calling is probably the best from a high bandwidth perspective, right? Because you can actually see people's faces and all that stuff and you get a lot more data. Um, and, you know, but phone is quite good uh, for whatever reason, we've adapted the phone much better than text, even though, you know, I don't think, you know, there's not, and there's nowhere near as much information in that as there is in a video call, uh, but phone, you still get tone and things like that a lot of the time, you know, but, and chat and email are often not great, right? So just, you know, it's kind of another thing is it, it builds your team if you can have high bandwidth communication more often. Um, and then, okay, and then poor meetings can kill a team. This is something that a lot of people, you know, have heard about, right? That meetings are often really bad. And the reason that is, is because meetings are usually poorly performed more than meetings in and of themselves are bad. And so the reason this is, is because meetings, um, different people have different styles of A, running a meeting and B, participating in a meeting. So that can be really difficult. Then on top of that, uh, meetings are often like, does anybody know what I mean when I say interrupt driven? How, how dated am I here? Um, okay, so, uh, you know, when I hit a key on a keyboard, it actually is in the computer, right? It's, it's an interrupt, it's called. And so I jokingly refer to myself as interrupt driven based on meetings a lot of the time. But what that means is, is that, you know, there's a notification that goes off and says, I should go to a meeting. And my, my conscious thought about that meeting is zero until that notification goes off, right? The problem with that is that a lot of meetings require context. You know, there's pre-work that you have to do. You have to go read a document or review a, a software architecture or review some requirements, something like that. And if you don't do that before the meeting, you're doing it during the meeting. And so you're not actually fully there, right? So one of the things that I do, like for example, is if I know that's gonna be the style of meeting that it is, and a lot of them are, is I'll actually put another meeting on my calendar to do that pre-work. Um, and so, and usually I can put it close enough to the actual meeting that I won't lose the context or whatever. Um, another thing that a lot of people swear by is using agendas for meetings, um, especially if with a timer, um, so that, you know, a, if you have to cover a certain set of topics that can be really useful. I think in software engineering world, a lot of our meetings um, are actually about one thing. They're often not about a set of things. So agendas in, in my mind are often less important, but it's kind of like, it's one of the tricks of if you wanna keep the meeting focused and feel like it's productive and things like that is if you actually put timers on things, it can move it along. It's, uh, it keeps people from going down rat holes and, you know, and talking about things that aren't relevant because this is not your only opportunity to have the discussion. You can have another call, right? So you, can, you can go in offline with, whoever it is you're arguing about, you know, some minor detail of the architecture with, you don't have to do it in a meeting where everybody else is. You can go somewhere else and have it. So I think one of the other things about meetings is I think a lot of the time people don't kind of respect everyone else in the room, not respect in a negative way, but it, it respect their time in that recognizing who needs to be in a conversation. You know, if you're in a room with 20 people, a meeting with 20 people, and you're having an architectural argument with one other person, you shouldn't be doing in the meeting, right? So that's another one. Uh, another example I like to give is this Amazon uh, paper meetings, uh, they call them, um, which are kind of famous in the industry. Uh, I don't know what they've been doing with these for COVID, but they used to have uh, physical paper copies. Uh, and what they would do is whatever you, of whatever you were supposed to have pre-worked for the meeting. And they would make the meeting, if they wanted the meeting to be, let's say half an hour, they would make the meeting an hour and the first 30 minutes is everyone reading the work, like the prep work for the meeting. So they would actually schedule it into the meeting itself, right? And it's usually was with a physical copy. So you can, so the person who has to prepare that document can also have like up to the last possible second to prepare it. Um, Cause that's off, off, often all the, the other problem with the pre-work, right? It's like, that means that whoever is, is leading the meeting needs to get the pre-work done, you know, with enough time in advance that you can consume it with this kind of meeting, you can do it in real time, right? Has the trade off personally of if it requires thinking, that may not be enough time to process whatever it was before you have to talk about it. 
right? Sometimes it's helpful for me at least, right? To consume something, sleep on it, then be ready to talk about it, if that makes sense. And so if you're doing one of these meetings, that may not work as well. So a little bit of it is, you know, people. All right, making sense so far? Not too boring, I hope. I understand this is not a normal software engineering subject, um, but it is ridiculously important. And the more awareness you have of it, uh, the more likely you are to succeed and lead good teams and be a good member of a team. Um, and then the last one is honesty. Um, and so uh, this is often also referred to as being authentic. Um, so the idea here is, uh, you know, be honest about what you can do, but, you know, and also, and I think most people interpret this as, this is my limit, but it's also to be honest about, oh, no, I, I can do this, right? Like, I'm perfectly capable of doing this whole set of things. Um, and I think people tend to downplay themselves, especially in a public uh, environment. Um, so, but being honest with your teammates is a big deal. And it really does help, uh, you know, what you're doing together. Um, has anybody ever heard of imposter syndrome? Can you raise hands? Let's see how many people have heard of imposter syndrome. I will not ask how many people think they have it. Uh, so um, imposter syndrome is totally a real thing. Uh, and it's this idea that um, somebody's going to find out that I am not actually qualified to be doing what I'm doing. Um, however, what I think is kind of funny with that, uh, I mean, not funny in a ha ha sort of way, but interesting is there's another thing called the Peter Principle, which is you will be promoted to your highest level of incompetence. Can anybody explain to me why that makes sense? So you'll be promoted to your highest level of incompetence. Yeah, sure. Potentially do well in your current position. People see that you do well. Then you get promoted. And you keep doing well until you stop doing well, right? And then you sit there until you're fired or you leave or you go back down. Right. So you're either the CEO or you are at your highest level of incompetence. So the idea is that when you're in a job, you should feel like an imposter. Right, because the reason you're in it is because you finished, for lack of a better term, the level you were in below. Right, so of course you feel like you don't know everything there is to know about that job. Of course you feel like everyone around you is going to discover that you don't have all the answers, because if they're not stupid, they should know that of course you're not going to, because that's why you're in that position. If you had all the answers, you would have been promoted into a new level of incompetence. So I know it's kind of a weird thing to say, right? But like, uh, it's something I think to think about, right? It's like, if you're, if you're really good, if you completed you know, everything there is about your job, there's something wrong, right? So there are tons of resources on the internet uh, around imposter syndrome. I strongly recommend them. Um, this is just kind of my personal take on it. Uh, and, you know, but like I said, it's very easy to fall into the trap. Try not to. It's, it's not pleasant. Um, so keep it in mind, it is something that happens across the board. And then kind of in a related way, when we're talking about teams, keep in mind that most of your team probably feels the same way. So you want to make sure you're not reinforcing their belief, right? This kind of goes back to that honesty thing. You want to expect the best, you know? Like I am 100% confident all the time that all of my teammates can do whatever they say they can do. And I am disappointed periodically. But that doesn't mean I don't go back and expect the best again. Yeah. So I used to have a friend actually, who I haven't actually seen in years, who every time he got close to being in management would quit and go take a lower level job. Because he was like, I just, I don't, I don't want to do that work. Um, no, he, he would leave and go to another company. But it is not like it's not unheard of. Uh, I would say it's uncommon, but it is not unheard of uh, to to kind of essentially ask for a demotion or to turn down a promotion. Um, I would say that's a little more common, um, where it's like actually this sort of happened to me actually, which was um, you know I was a software engineer or whatever, 
And um, somebody asked me, you know, if I wanted to take on kind of more of a managerial role and it was in consulting. And, you know, my question back to them was like, wait, so that means I have to care about our company's politics, right? Because as a, as an engineering, like software consultant, all I cared about was another company's politics because that is what mattered to me, but I didn't actually have any quote unquote skin in the game, right? Like there was nothing really bad that was gonna happen to me if I pissed off the wrong person because it was another organization. If I was management in my own organization, oh no, now I have to care what people think of me. So I, I hemmed and hawed for quite some time about whether or not I wanted to take that job because it would change my kind of relationship with my company. Um, so like I said, turning down promotions, I would say still uncommon, not crazily uncommon actually being demoted by choice, uh, also like even more uncommon, but also not unheard. All right, everything makes sense so far? Cool. All right, so team agreements. The reason I bring this up like this is, and you know, you can find countless examples on the internet, but the reason I bring it up this way is because these are some of the important things that if you capture them on paper, you will have a better day. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I should just make it a mantra or something, right? But spoken, you know, spoken language is very lossy, right? Like we lose a lot of information. When I try to communicate something to you in voice, you don't always hear what I said or what I think I said, I should say. Um, if you write it, it becomes much clearer. Um, and it can be edited, it can be tuned, it can be whatever to make sure it's clear to the whole team. So when you think about these things, this is a written document where everyone has looked at it. Everyone agrees that the language in it says what they think it says. And if you cover these items, it'll usually be a good one. If that makes sense. You know, you can drop, you know, one or two or whatever, or add, more importantly, you can add stuff that is more typical. But if you have these, usually things go a lot better. So first up, why do we exist? Okay, what is our mission, right? What is our goal? And this should be something quote unquote grand, okay? And then by almost by counter, but kind of related is what are our values? So, you know, our mission is to, you know, we're Amazon, right? Is to change retail for every person. Um, you know, I, I want to make it so that you can get anything that you want at any time. But our values might be, but we want to do it ethically, right? Like let's maybe we're, we're doing our new Amazon and everything must be, you know, equal exchange, right? So there cannot be any exploited workers in anything involving our retail. So the value might be something ethical or moral, or it might be, um, you know, uh, it, it's more important to release than it is uh, to have all the bugs out, right? Uh, which is not a bad thing to do necessarily. So the values describe that kind of stuff. Responsibilities. Who's responsible for what? Okay. And it could be, it can be written as role, but it can also be written as, you know, Langdon is responsible for ABC, right? Um, typically I would say it's role because that way the who's responsible for what can kind of shift around. Um, and that way people don't get bored. Uh, decisions. This is another big one um, where who is making decisions and how. Okay. And it seems, I think a lot of people, especially if they're, if they're new to kind of working world and all that stuff, it seems like, well, I got a team, right? The whole team should make every decision. Well, that's, that's just massively inefficient as well as often not very useful. Um, so deciding how you're going to make decisions can be really beneficial. And it's often not kind of how you make all decisions. It's more like, if it's this kind of decision, are we taking this new member on the team? Is that a team decision? So like everybody weighs in or there's, or let's say, um, you know, three out of the five must agree that this person is a good addition to the team. Um, another one decision is like, should this pull request actually be included? Okay, uh, I would say fairly typically, you have to have two, what's called LGTM, right? Two looks good to me before any pull request is pulled in, okay? So those are what I mean by decisions. They don't have to be equal. They don't have to be about the same kinds of things, 
they most especially don't have to be the same level of decision making as something else. Um, and then how we work. Uh, this one, particularly, I like to focus it on communication. What is the expected response time on things like Slack messages, on email, on whatever? Um, because we have very different definitions. So like there's somebody I work with here who if I slap them something, two days later, I'll get a response. But if I email them something, I will get a response in 15 seconds. Because their style of working has been, for whatever reason, that's just how they communicate. They use email. Uh, and if you know, none of you are old enough to remember this, right? But before all these instant messaging tools and stuff like that, email was regularly used as if it was text messaging. Okay, so if you kind of grew up with that or were trained that way, whether you were actually old enough to have done that, um, email is still your default. That's what you, what you live in every day, right? Um, and then metrics. So metrics are super important. How are we gonna be measured, okay? And this is something that you wanna be careful that you decide as a team, it's much better for you to say, this is how we're going to be measured rather than somebody who's outside the team telling you how you're gonna be measured, okay? Um, and oh, I meant to look this up beforehand because I have a mental block today. Um, you probably know this. What do you, it's something KO uh, where you, Red Hat's been doing them. Um, I can't think of the term, uh, but basically there was this thing introduced by Google about uh, kind of doing uh, metrics using OKRs, that's it. Um, so objective, and what are the KR? Uh, kill and ransom, I think that's what it is. Um, all right, let me just look it up because I have like a total mental block. Objectives and key results, that's it. Um, so objectives is like kind of the ideas, right? And then the key results, those are the measures you're gonna use to use them. Um, and so that OKR push that got really popular in the industry a few years ago, has helped a lot on teams being able to define their own metrics. Whether they were using this OKR construct or not, that, uh, you know, that expectation that the teams define their own metrics uh, has become much more pervasive and generally speaking, it's a good thing. Um, and then meetings and standup. Who here knows what a standup is? What is it? Yeah, so usually there's a prescribed list of questions um, and they typically are something along the lines of, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And what do you need help with? Um, and it's, it's more like the reason it's shorter is because everyone's uncomfortable is the idea. So that's why everybody's supposed to stand up. So whatever, whatever makes everyone uncomfortable in the team so that that way everybody goes through it as fast as possible. And typically they're daily, um, but not always. Uh, but so that's what a standup is. Um, they are super useful, uh, particularly for teaming. Um, and uh, this is our guest lecturer. Um, and uh, so they're they're really because they they get you to ask for help, which is as you all I'm sure know is a hard thing to do. Um, and then meetings talk about how are meetings going to be run. If you have somebody who is very agenda focused, you should probably do meetings that way, okay? Um, and then the last one, which I think is almost the most important is definition of done, because this goes back to that English problem of what I say and what you hear are not necessarily the same thing, right? So if I wrote all the code, am I done with whatever I said I was gonna do? Anyone, what's your opinion? Kind of, right? So this is where definition of done comes in really is, is kind of rears its ugly head the most, right? Which is, okay, some people consider done code complete. Some people consider done code complete and all tests run. Some people consider done all code complete, all tests run and deploy to production. So if you aren't all on the same page on that, you're again, gonna have a bad day, right? Uh, so that's why definition of done is really important. Um, in many of the projects I've worked on, we actually have done definition of done for, for um, like kind of each team and then kind of what the acceptance criteria is for that particular thing as well, which is kind of related. Um, so but I think that's where we'll stop.
I will talk a little bit more about job descriptions. Well, so next time we're going to do product pitches or partner pitches. Um, so you'll hear about all the projects we have that we're going to work on this semester um, and then fill out a form that says, I want to do that one or that one or that one. Um, and then the one after that, we're going to we're going to finish some of this up, but we'll also. I think oh, we'll start talking about requirements gathering um, and then we'll do the second half of the ethics conversation uh, that we're going to do right now. Um, any questions for where we are? Yes. Right, right. As much as we can. Yeah. No promises. Um, but yeah, so we'll probably put the uh, teams together like Friday-ish next week. Um, and the goal is to have an out call of you by Monday. So not this coming, but the one after. Make sense? Yeah. Um, and that way the PMs will be able to start having the PM meetings and all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, go from there kind of. All right, any other questions? All right. Uh, so Seth, again, I mean, I'll let you introduce yourself because I don't want to slaughter your last name. <laughs> um, but let me open your slides. Oh, well, it's in, uh, hello everyone, I'm Seth, nice to meet you. This will start with a, a little bit about me. So I'm a fifth year PhD student, currently in the School of Theology studying religion and science. I mainly focus on how do you create an intersection between values and technology my main area of interest. Uh, I've actually been working with PU Spark for this is my second year working with PU Spark, and mainly working with the Zebra Primer, uh, specifically on how to help teams kind of look at their projects and stuff like that. Uh, I've also been working with Wesley Wildman, uh, who's a professor, to put together some of the PhD requirements for the new uh, kind of ethics and responsible computing component of the PhD in data science. So this is something that is actually being developed right now. Like there's a whole new university unit, as I'm sure you know, that's going on. And so actually your feedback in this regard in terms of how stuff is useful, especially as you're thinking throughout the semester, the sort of preparation things of what kinds of things are helpful, what's actually practical, is a good time to give that feedback because people are making lots of decisions about what the standards will look like going forward. So if you've ever wondered if that kind of feedback would actually be utilized, this is the time I'd say more so than ever that we're gonna be looking at that. So the thing I'm gonna be talking to you about today is something called algorithmic fairness and specifically about this thing called the compass assessment from a ProPublica article called Machine Bias. So I told you a little bit about my background, but just a little bit more. So I initially got into this because uh, I went to Stanford. So I was in Silicon Valley, you know lots of coders and programmers. And actually, if you're working at, you know, Facebook, Google, or in startups, you just run into certain kinds of problems and, and stuff like that. And actually, we're not, I, I don't think anyone has like an authoritative idea of how to handle these things, but we're gonna try and give you tools to ask the right questions and get into that. My own sort of specific research is on something called like techno-utopianism. And, and what that kind of means is, can you use technology to solve every single problem? Maybe not. Uh, but it's definitely something to think about when you're designing things, especially as you're thinking about what the actual products you're going to create are. Uh, I also do talk about technological ethics and something called digital ethics. We have some conversations with academics and things like that. But all that's just to say is uh, this is kind of my special kind of area of interest. And if you have any questions as things come up, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'm happy to answer it as you have things. So in terms of the things we're going to be talking about, we're first going to talk a little bit about what is ethics and responsible computing. Uh, we're going to talk about the machine bias kind of article, kind of a big overview of it. Then we'll get a little bit more into the assessment itself, two perspectives on fairness in terms of kind of how it works. Then finally, kind of a more broader sense of ethics and data science in general. Then this question of predictive policing, which I think is really core to the technology involved. All right, so ethics and responsible competing is basically the way that Boston University talks about this. We usually call it ERC, and basically refers to the tools, habits, and practices that help to make one responsible decisions with computing. So anything involving a computer, anytime there's something like that involved, we're talking about ERC. And some things that you might want to look at is the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, is a professional organization. They have a code of conduct, which it would be good to kind of know about um probably to look through at some point 
just because when you do become a professional, it's going to be one of the things that's, that's going to be kind of governing your behavior. It's, it's something that all professionals are expected to do. Also, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has a pretty good article on the application of specific ethical theories to computers and to computer networks. We're talking about things like virtue ethics, deontology, utilitarianism. I'm actually not going to get into those things today, so you don't need to worry about this. This is an ethics class, a data science class. But if you do have questions about those things, we can definitely talk about it at some other point. So the main topic of today is going to be about this ProPublica article on machine bias. And basically their investigation of a couple of different people as kind of examples of a broader kind of data trend that they spotted, which is specifically relative differences in sentencing in recidivism sentencing as a result of race. So let's talk about what the assessment actually is. So first off, it's created by North Point. Um, they, this company actually completely rebranded itself when I was looking them up. Uh, just a few months ago to Equivant. So they've completely changed themselves as a result of what this article found. So the assessment itself is 100 plus questions designed to assess the relative risk of releasing someone from prison based on how likely they are to commit another crime or recidivism, right? That's the tendency to commit another crime. So what ProPublica actually discovered and why it was kind of a bombshell article is because they were able to show that Black American, Americans were given nearly twice as high of a score in the assessment, and the assessment gives you a score of one to 10, and that only 20% of the people that were predicted to commit a violent crime in the future went on to do so. So what that basically means is they have 100 plus questions, and if we wanna look at what some of those questions are, they look kind of like this, and tries to boil that all down to a single number, but it turns out that that number wasn't actually very predictive, right? So if you predict that something's going to happen and you're only right 20% of the time, that's actually a, I don't know, it's like an anti-problem, right? That means you're actually better at not predicting it than predicting it. It's kind of like the Coke and Pepsi problem, right? Maybe you can tell between Coke and Pepsi, you don't know which one is which. So if we look at these actual questions, usually it's gonna be related to how many crimes someone, has committed, and these are really specific types of things, like have you committed a drug felony, right? Have you committed a misdemeanor? How many have you committed? And these sorts of things. So as you know, people interested in your own set of machine learning data infrastructure, you can just think about what kinds of criteria it's important, important for, how did they actually design these, so like zero, one, two, three plus, why did they pick those numbers? You know, it's not specifically related to the article, but there are things to keep in mind as you're designing your own things. One of the other things that was actually brought up by this assessment is they would ask people about connections that they had. So for instance, do you have a relative that's ever been incarcerated? And that gets into some, so some thorny issues in particular because having a relative who may have a criminal past shouldn't have a bearing on your own, say, criminality, let's say, but are they going to use some sort of correlation to assess someone? And that's where we get into lots of really uh, nitty gritty territory, let's say, but things that could be potentially problematic in lots of ways. So what is the actual use case for this? And this is, um, as people are kind of designing their own products, is something you might want to think about. Why did they try to make this thing in the first place? So recidivism is actually one of the most important topics in cr criminal justice. So if you're thinking about when someone gets to a certain point, maybe you know, you've probably seen this in movies or something. It's like, oh, someone's released on good behavior. A lot of that has to do with assessments like these. Maybe not a tool, but they'll go in front of a judge and that judge will have to decide, oh, has this, what's the relative risk of releasing this person? Should they be kept in prison? Should they be put on probation? Should they not have probation? All these sorts of decisions are weighed based on that particular person's case. So what, North Point was hoping to do is to take a lot of information, right? Almost too much information for a person to process about every single case. And if you've been to court, you can know that sometimes these cases go really fast. You might only have 10 to 15 minutes with a judge to decide on somebody. And so as a result of that, they're hoping to take lots and lots of data and put it into a single number that will help that judge to make a good decision. So if it's working as intended, the tool will provide an unbiased data-backed assessment 
that is accurate to what happens in the future. And again, that means if you predict something that's going to happen and then it happens, or pr predict that something won't happen and it won't happen, right? That means you're accurate to what's actually going to be going on. And so we're thinking, well, why might this actually be necessary? And I'll point you to something like this. So this is um, from Danziger 2011. This is a very funny study in part because it basically shows that judges tend to be more lenient right after they've eaten, right? So if a judge had a snack, right, morning snack right here, they tend to be in a better mood. And so they give more lenient sentences. The same thing right after lunch. And you'll notice they actually give the worst sentences right before lunch, right? So there's these kinds of random factors that have been studied through you know, data science methods to basically uncover, oh, there's this kind of problem that's going on in the justice system just as a result of people's biology, right? And so if you're trying to have more objective ways of assessing people rather than just, it, because it's not just a matter of the neutral facts, right? But rather how those neutral facts fit into this larger societal system, which then impacts, you know, somebody's life. And if you can think about it, it's, it actually really matters if you get out of jail two years sooner, if you get on probation, all these things really affect your life. And so how that comes down really matters. So how did their assessment actually work? And I'm pointing to three different risk scales. So there's a pretrial risk scale, which is basically before anything happens, like you actually go to court, it's a specific kind of assessment and it assesses somebody before anything even happens. The one that ProPublica was actually specifically talking about is this thing called the general recidivism scale, right? Which is that the likelihood of someone to commit another crime. And as you can see from these, uh, I think hopefully maybe we'll be able to release this presentation. Uh, basically, it's just gonna go through a lot of the stuff that I showed you before. What kinds of charges have people had? How many have they had? Uh, what's their prior arrest history like? And try to boil all those things down into different metrics in each of these different scales. Then finally, there's the violent recidivism scale, which isn't just uh, the tendency to commit another crime, but also the tendency to commit a specifically a violent crime, which the core argument of the ProPublica article actually centers on this third scale, which is that most of the people that they said would commit a violent crime in the future did not go on to do so. And so that's one of the most extreme cases. And actually it's one of the most one of the things you'd be most worried about if you're releasing someone from prison of whether they'll go on to be violent once again. So th this is uh, information coming from Joan Feigenbaum, who is a professor at Yale. And she basically wants to compare two things on fairness here. So North Point, the creators of the assessment are basically gonna say, okay, we created this assessment and we made it as fair as possible, right? But they don't have it, but they don't just say it's fair, right? They have to have some sort of defense of that. And what they basically say is for each value of C, right? And this can be any number. So for every value of one, every value of two, three, four, five, the percentage of white defendants with score C who reoffend is very nearly equal to the percentage of black defendants with score C who reoffend. So what this means is that no matter what race someone is, if you're given a five, the percentage of reoffense is going to be the same for, for everyone. Or at least that's what they're saying. This is something called balance or equalized odds, right? Which means that the, the five always means a five, doesn't matter who it goes towards. But what ProPublica is basically saying is that among the defense who did not reoffend, right, for whom the assessment was actually inaccurate, uh, Black Americans were more than twice as likely to be scored in the upper range of the metric. So what does this actually look like? This looks something like this. So up here we have black defendants risk scores and white defendant risk scores. And we can see just from looking at this that there's some obvious disparities, right? Just, just on the face of it. So the first thing we can notice is that for the white defendants, there's an overwhelming amount of ones, right? Which is the very lowest score that you can have. And actually in the ProPublica article itself, it, it goes on to talk about someone who was given a very low score, but then went on to commit a violent crime, right? So th again, this sort of stuff, when we're making recommendations really matters. But for black defendants, we have a much more like kind of evenly spread range. But what's more important is that this from like five to 10 range, which is kind of like the higher end of the range is very, very starkly different. 
right? So if we are to, so basically what they're saying is, if you happen to be black, right? And this is kind of what it comes down to, you're twice as likely to be put in the upper half of the range, which again, really affects how your sentencing is actually going to go. It means that you're being projected as going to commit a crime in the future, even though, as we mentioned earlier, that's not what actually happened. So, so what we talk about is the, this is something called the lack of calibration. And basically this is always gonna be an issue when you have differences in rate. And this is caused by the fact that the actual recidivism rate between the two different populations isn't the same, right? So because of this 58 versus 33 number, that basically accounts for the discrepancy in why one group is being weighted towards the range over the other. And because of that, you, you can't have a model that kind of treats both groups fairly. So in other words, you're either gonna have a model in which the kind of like, a, say like a five won't really be a five for people in both groups, or you're gonna have this kind of um, weighted distribution in which one group of people is more evenly spread towards the top and the other group is not towards the bottom. It's just kind of a factor of how the, the data, the, the kind of underlying data actually works. So because of that, and this is something from Kearns and Roth, it is impossible for the predictive algorithm to have near equal numbers of false positives and false negatives it can achieve one or the other in its statistical parity. And what does that mean in this case? So basically what this model does, we'll go and look at the data again, is the false positive rate, right? Which is calling something, saying something's gonna happen that doesn't happen, is much more likely for a black American versus a false negative is much more likely for a white American, which is what causes this big, imbalance, not only in terms of what's actually happening, but also just in how the scores are actually distributed. So why is this there? Why is there this discrepancy? Well, this is always going to occur anytime there are two or more groups with observed differences in rate. And, and this is going to be for, for anything. It doesn't have to be related to race specifically. It could be you know, preferences and vegetables, it really could be anything. But anytime you have these different kinds of rates, what that is gonna mean that any single metric, and this is kind of the key here, the single metric can't capture all of those kind of nuances inside of it, right? Because remember, we're taking hundreds of questions and boiling it down to a single number. And what are some of the issues here? Well, we have to figure that it could be the case that the information upon which the predictions are being made might itself be biased, right? There could be historical discrimination, other kinds of things that could be affecting the kind of criminal record, which make it an, an issue, right? So there could be some past prejudice, which is in the data already that we would have to account for. And I think this is a, the third point is probably the most important for all of you, which is that predictions of this type assume reliable and near perfect information which is uh, untrue. That's just not how the real world works. So this is especially true because groups who have been kind of historically marginalized are also the least cooperative when it comes to getting this kind of information, right? So because of that, um, if you actually kind of follow law enforcement technology and the way in which they're trying to implement it, especially in these kind of a, like quote underserved neighborhoods, they often don't want it because they're afraid of more intervention coming into their neighborhoods and kind of causing more problems rather than solving them. So because of that, there's not cooperation there and getting the kind of information that would make the law enforcement technologists ha happy isn't really happening, right? And that's one of the things that's gonna be going on and you should always be thinking about that of what kind of noise might be in your data. So in terms of uh, predictive policing, because that's honestly what we're talking about, right? Which is how can we project what it is that people are going to be doing in the future? And so a bunch of mathematicians got together in 2010 in June, and they wrote a letter to, a letter to the American Mathematics Society 
urging that they shouldn't do any, they should, shouldn't do this kind of research. They just don't think that it's beneficial. They don't think it's going in the right direction. And part of that just has to do with, you know, the risk of being wrong is much higher, right? Because remember, if you're in a different group, your risk rate of being falsely identified as someone who's likely to reoffend could be much higher, right? So it's not even that the the kind the way in which the data is wrong is different between the groups too. So one of the other things we might have to consider is that having a flawed tool might actually reinforce rather than reduce bias. Because again, if we're trying to give North Point kind of the benefit of the doubt in terms of the tool that they made to reduce bias, if you have someone who maybe has some potential bias and they see a very low number, right? It may reinforce their conclusion and make them more confident in what they've arrived to. And the same could be in reverse, right? If they think that someone's gonna be violent and they see that score, it's not causing them to say, look into their assumptions, but rather kind of makes them more comfortable in them. And this is actually something that happens with technology all the, all the time. It's a kind of overconfidence that happens. So, and then finally, there's kind of a, a deeper philosophical question here, which is about if you can really hold people accountable for things that they haven't done yet based off of kind of broad trends, right? Do you treat people as individuals or kind of as instances of statistical significance, right? And this is very important for what you know machine learning looks like, the ways in which people are trying to apply things. And well, it's a really big part of the space. I'd really encourage all of you to just look at it, um, especially in terms of things like, say, image recognition is really big in the law enforcement space as well. And a lot of funding from, say, FBI, other kinds of agencies. So these are real technologies that are being developed. But how you pursue those things and whether they're able to accomplish what you would like them to do is very important. And with that, I'm just wondering if anyone has any kind of final questions about this or about anything else you brought up today. I have one yep. that you brought up in the other class where we talked about this, um, sure. which I don't think I heard you mention, is that one of the important things to remember here is that there was likely no ill intent for right. any of them at all. Um, yeah. And just so you Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. So um, part of the reason why I brought up this example of lunch, right? is because there's this idea, I think, especially going on right now of, it's not fair to anyone if they have a judge that's potentially prejudiced against them, right? I think we can all agree on that. And so if you have a tool, some sort of a neutral tool that can go through somebody's history and make an accurate prediction about them, maybe that's, maybe that's better than not having a tool, right? And so as the developers, right? What sorts of problems are you trying to solve? But not only that, is your tool actually solving the problem that you would hope it would? Because I would think if, if uh, North Point was hoping to reduce prejudice with their tool, um, they actually kind of did the opposite, uh, unfortunately. And these sorts of assessment tools aren't just made by North Point. There are other ones kind of in competition. But, but there's a high amount of interest in them because of this thought that the technology will help them to be more, more neutral. But there's a problem if you think that the technology is helping to be more neutral, but it's actually biased in some way, right? And then you're actually creating a much bigger problem than you would have had otherwise. And so monitoring things, making sure that it works as intended, these things are all very crucial. And I think, uh, especially for more kind of like socially charged sorts of activities, things that are really interested in that, it's that kind of monitoring effort I think could be really crucial. But uh oh yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I want to reinforce one thing about that, right? And and you've heard me talk about this before. This is like one of the ways you help to solve for this is that diversity within teams. Right, is that you don't see a lot of problems when you only have one perspective. And, you know, with the predominance of people who are very, very similar in software engineering, it makes it very, very difficult for them to just even realize that there's, there may be these kinds of problems. Um, the other thing I want to reinforce is that there is a long running rule of thumb 
If you ever have to call customer service about a complaint, do it right after lunch. And you will actually literally get a better response. The other trick too is also smile while you're on the phone and you will get a better response from whoever you talk to, weirdly enough. Um, so two things. So what we're doing uh, is for kind of the assessment part of this or uh, the like homework part of this um, is uh, there is take a look at some case studies uh, and you pick one basically and then kind of assess the, the ethics of it. Uh, and so that's up on Gradescope right now. I will try to post a piazza pointing at it uh, probably right after this class is over, but it is on Gradescope right now. You can see it. The other one is to find something reasonably current uh, that, that you think demonstrates uh, you know, something in this kind of ethical space um, and look at the, uh, and then basically there's kind of assessing that as well, right? So kind of find your own case study in a sense. Um, and I strongly encourage all of you to, you know, use some outside interest uh, to try to help inform whatever, you know, current event story you find, you know, like my friend with the, you know, race cars and stuff, you know, maybe there's some tech in there that is got some ethical questions, who knows, um, because we're going to try to share them all as a collective uh, come in the future class. And the more diversity we have and what, you know, results you get, I'm sure it'll be a much more interesting class. Um, but like I said before, weirdly, it will be due Monday at 4 p.m. Um, just so that we have a time to review the, your, your results and then we can have something intelligent to say by Thursday. Um, so questions? <laughs>